In this video we'll be going through the 2020 Level 2 Mechanics paper. Question 1. Alex and Joe have decided to take a road trip. They start from rest on a straight road and accelerate at 4.2 meters per second per second. Show their velocity after 0.6 seconds is 2.5 meters per second. And so we're given the acceleration as well as the time. And we need to find the velocity. The equation we can use to relate these is that acceleration is equal to velocity over time. Solving that for velocity by multiplying both sides by t, substituting our numbers, and that gives me 2.52, or to two significant figures, 2.5 meters per second. While waiting at the traffic lights, Joe has to put on the handbrake to stop the car rolling down the steep 10 degree slope they are on. The mass of the car and occupants is 1,600 kgs. The diagram above shows the friction force acting between the tires and the road. Add labelled arrows to show the other two forces acting on the stationary car. And so we of course have the force of gravity. We also have the reaction force, or the normal force, or the support force, whichever you want to call it. Complete a labelled vector diagram showing how all three forces add together. Okay, so first of all, we know that the vectors all add together to zero. We know this because the car is stationary, which must mean that the net force is zero. Which means that if you take the downward gravity force, add on the force of friction, and then finally add the support force, you should get a nice right angle triangle, where our 10 degrees is the angle between gravity and the support force. By first working out the force of gravity on the car, show that the value of the friction force required to keep the car stationary is 2,700 newtons. And so we're given the mass of the car above, I recall, which is 1,600 kgs, which means that the force of gravity, given by mass times the acceleration due to gravity, is just 1,600, our mass, times the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8, which gives me 15680. And the units are newtons. Now, in order to find the force of friction, we need to use a bit of Sokotoa. And so you might recall using Sokotoa that sine of the angle is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse which means that sine of 10 degrees is equal to our opposite, which is our friction force, divided by our hypotenuse, which is our force of gravity. We can solve that for our friction force by multiplying both sides by the force of gravity. Put in our force of gravity and throw that into our calculator. Which gives me 2,700 to two significant figures, and our units are of course newtons. While travelling at 50 km per hour, Jo sees a pothole in the road 15 metres ahead. She must reduce her speed from 50 km per hour to 20 km per hour to avoid damaging the car. If the time needed for safe braking from 50 km per hour to 20 km per hour is 2.3 seconds, Show by calculation whether there is enough time to complete braking before reaching the pothole. You should start by showing that 50 km per hour is 13.89 meters per second, which is generous that they're reminding us that we need to convert our units. So we'll of course start off by doing those unit conversions. So our initial velocity is of course our 50 km per hour. Now, 50 kilometers is 50,000 meters, and an hour is 3,600 seconds, which gives me 13.89 meters per second, which is the same as what they have above. 
doing the same for our final velocity of 20 kilometers per hour. Gives me 5.556 meters per second. And now the other things we're given is the distance as well as the required time. And now all we need to do is choose a kinematic equation. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this equation here. And if I put in my initial velocity, my final velocity, and my time into it, it will give me the stopping distance. And if it's less than 15, that means that Joe has indeed stopped in time. If it's greater than 15, that means that she's gone over the pothole. So, putting our numbers in. Which gives me 22 meters to two significant figures. What this means is that if it takes her 2.3 seconds to break from our 50 kilometers per hour to our 20 kilometers per hour, she's going to travel 22 meters, which is of course going to see her go further than our 15 meter pothole. So let's write something to that effect. Joe travels 22 meters in the time required her to safely break. She thus hits the pothole at a speed greater than 20 kilometers per hour. Question two. Joe and Alex continue their drive and take a sharp bend in the road at a constant speed of 12 meters per second. Draw an arrow on the car on the diagram above to show the direction of the acceleration at this point. And so we're told that the speed is constant, but that the car is also accelerating, which means that the acceleration is centripetal and is of course towards the center of the motion. Calculate the size of the acceleration if the radius of the bend is 25 meters and explain what causes this acceleration. So let's start with what we're given. Our radius is 25 meters. Our speed is 12 meters per second. The equation we want for centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. Putting our numbers in. Gives me 5.8 meters per second per second to two significant figures. As for the cause of the acceleration, well that is due to the centripetal force which is being provided by the friction force with the road. The centripetal acceleration is a result of the friction force between the tires and the road. State two external factors that could change the motion of the car as it travels around the corner and explain how these factors would affect the motion. And so there are many factors that could affect the motion of the car around the corner, such as the mass of the car or the speed that it is going, but they use the key word external factors. And the way that the car interacts with its external environment is through this friction force we talked about earlier. The nature of this friction force is going to be determined by the surface properties of the road or the surface properties of the tires. So for the road condition, factors that might affect that are whether it's dry or wet or sealed or unsealed. Our other factor is the tire condition, the main factor of which is the amount of tread. Poor road or tire condition could reduce the friction force reducing the speed at which the corner can safely be completed. The pair continue on their journey at a constant speed of 12 meters per second. The car is fitted with a crumple zone. Alex says the crumple zone can increase the time of impact in a collision from 0.2 seconds to 0.8 seconds. The mass of the car and occupants is 1600 kilograms. Use physics principles and appropriate calculations to explain how having a crumple zone can make this car safer for the occupants during a collision. So the situation here is that we're going from a speed of 12 meters per second to 0 meters per second to a stop. And the time at which it does that is either 0 0.2 seconds or 0 0.8 seconds. The difference in these times is going to be reflected in the force experienced by the car and the occupants. 
So let's start off by writing down what we're given. Our change in velocity is 12 meters per second. Our first change in time is 0.2 seconds. And our second change in time is 0.8 seconds. And the mass of our car is 1,600 kgs. Now, the main concept in this question is impulse. And for that, we're interested in the change in momentum, the time at which it changes, and the resulting force. The change in momentum, in both cases, is just the mass times our change in velocity which is 19,200 kg meters per second. Now, as for our forces, we can use the equation that the force is equal to the change in momentum divided by our change in time. And I'm going to do that for both our time 1 and our time 2 to find our force 1 and our force 2. Putting in our numbers, gives me 96,000 newtons and 24,000 newtons. So as we can see, by increasing the duration of the collision from 0.2 to 0.8, we have drastically reduced the force experienced by the car and the occupants. So let's put that into words. Increasing the duration of the collision reduces the force experienced by the occupants and therefore their injuries. Question 3. Joe and Alex need to cross a bridge to reach their destination. The bridge is 30 metres long and has a mass of 30,000 kg. The supports are 26 metres apart and equal distance from the centre of the bridge. State two requirements for an object to be in equilibrium. So, quite simply, the net force and net torque must equal zero. The road is closed as the bridge is under repair. The support column at end B can supply a maximum support force of 160,000 newtons. By finding torques about support A, calculate the furthest distance from support A that a 1600 kg mass could be placed before the support at B became overloaded. So let's start off by drawing in our forces, which will let us map out the torques. We have our support forces upwards from A and B. We have the weight force of our bridge acting from the middle. And we also have a 1600 kg mass that is at some distance that we don't currently know. So let's just draw that in anywhere. Now we're told that the support column B can apply a maximum force of 160 newtons, and we're asked to calculate the furthest distance from support A that our mass of 1600 kgs can be. So if we equate our anti-clockwise torque from force B with our clockwise torques from the force of the mass and the weight of the bridge, we should have an equation that we can solve for the distance of our 1600 kg mass. So let's do that, and I'll start off as per usual by writing what we're given. The weight force of our bridge is going to be the mass of the bridge, which is 30,000 kilograms times 9.8, which gives me 294,000 newtons. The force of our support B is 160,000 newtons. And our mass is 1600 kgs. Now for the actual algebra. So we can start with a statement that the torque in the clockwise direction is equal to the torque in the counterclockwise direction. Our clockwise torques are from our mass and the weight of our bridge, and our counterclockwise torque is just from support B. Now we want to replace our torques with their force times distances via that equation there. But we of course need to know the distances. So from our mass, it is the distance that we are of course trying to find. And since our supports are 26 meters apart, that means force of B is 26 meters away from our pivot, as indicated down here. The weight force of the bridge is going to be half of that since it's in the middle of the bridge. Thus it's going to be 13 meters. 
So for the torque from our mass, that's just going to be our unknown distance d multiplied by the force of gravity on that mass, which is just going to be mass times the acceleration due to gravity. The torque from the weight of our bridge is going to be its distance from our support A, which is 13 meters, multiplied by the weight force. The torque from support B is just going to be its distance, which is 26 meters, times the force that it's providing. So now all we need to do is solve this here equation for our D. So first of all, I'm going to subtract 13FW from both sides. Then I'm going to divide both sides by mg. Putting our numbers in, which gives me 21.556. And in the question, we're given two significant figures. So we're going to round it to two significant figures, which gives us 22 meters. The bridge has an earthquake protection system made up of springs. Before being put in place on the bridge, the springs are tested by being loaded with a mass M. When loaded with a mass M, the springs compress by a distance X. Explain in depth how the size of the mass on the springs needs to change in order to compress the springs a distance to X from the original length. And so the relationship between the force on a spring and the compression is given by Hooke's law. And if we wanted to relate the mass in there, we can replace our force with the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. And so we can see by this equation that in order to get an increase in x, we must also have an increase in the mass. Furthermore, since it is a linear relationship, that is that there aren't any square roots or squares or anything involved, these two are going to change in direct proportion to each other. Throughout this process, we can reasonably assume that the spring remains the same, and thus does the spring constant, as well as the gravitational acceleration, provided we don't change planets suddenly. So let's put this into words. F equals mg equals negative kx shows that a change in mass will produce a proportional change in x, as g and k are constant. Thus, doubling the mass will produce a 2x change in length. Joe and Alex wonder whether a compressed spring from the bridge could accelerate their car once the spring is released, as in the diagram below. They decide to determine the effect of the spring on the car's motion. They estimate that for the spring, a force of 50,000 newtons would compress the spring length from 6 meters to 4.2 meters. The total mass of the car and its occupants is 1600 kilograms. Calculate the maximum speed to which the spring could accelerate the car and its occupants if it was compressed to 4.2 meters. You should start your answer by first determining the spring constant k. Okay, so for this problem, we're going to use conservation of energy. So to find the maximum speed, we're going to use the fact that ek equals half mv squared. We know the mass, we want to find the velocity, but we don't know the energy. Now the kinetic energy gotten out of the spring is going to be equal to the potential energy stored in the spring, which is equal to half kx squared. Where we know the compression, but we don't know the k, hence why we're asked to find it first. To find the k, we need to use the equation f equals negative kx. Solving that for k by dividing both sides by negative x gives us negative f over x. So let's look above at what quantities we have. So our force is 50,000 newtons, and our x is the difference between 6 meters and 4.2 meters which is 1.8 meters. Now, since force and displacement are in opposite directions to each other, in order for our negative to work out in this equation here, one of these needs to be negative, so I'll somewhat arbitrarily make that force. So let's put our numbers in. And our negatives cancel out, which gives me a spring constant of 27778 newtons per meter, 
which I've given to five significant figures just to alleviate any rounding errors towards the end. Now moving on to our next column to find the kinetic energy, we can put our numbers in here, which gives me 45,000 joules. Now on to our final column, we need to solve this for our velocity. To do that, I'm first going to double both sides. Now I'm going to divide both sides by mass. And finally, I'm going to square root both sides and also swap them around. Putting our numbers in. Which gives me precisely 7.5 meters per second. What assumptions have you made in this calculation? So our main assumption is this one here, and that is that all of the potential energy from the spring was transferred to kinetic energy. Now, in the real world, there is of course going to be some heat involved, so you're not going to get all of that energy transferred to kinetic energy. Some of it is also going to be lost as heat. So let's write that down. We assumed that all of the elastic potential energy was converted to kinetic energy, when in fact there would have been losses to friction and heat. And we're done.